back up. Committee will come to order. Uh, before we start today, um, I have a special guest here that I'd like to introduce. Today is uh, Student Youth Foster Days. We have foster um, students from around the country. If you see people wearing these little pins, they are shadowing a congressman today. Uh, and, and I'd like uh, Timothy Dennis. Timothy's been here before. So, Timothy, if you'd stand up and be recognized. I know you're here somewhere. Oh, here he is, back over here. So he's going to be with me today. And these are, these are remarkable young people who've overcome a lot, of, uh, a lot of obstacles in their lives. So when you see them, have a chance to stop and just say a few words and find out what their story is. Um, good morning, and thank all of you all for being here today to discuss the President's fiscal year uh, 2018 budget submission for the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, the budget is not about numbers, it's about priorities. Yesterday afternoon, the President proposed a $6.4 billion increase in VA's budget, which is reflective of the high priority that this administration places on serving our veterans. I applaud that action and share the, uh, the feeling that second, perhaps only to ensuring our ongoing national security, there is no greater priority we have than caring for those who have borne the burden of our battles. This budget was released less than 24 hours ago. In the coming weeks, our subcommittees will hold hearings to discuss different aspects of the budget in depth. However, during this morning's hearing, I want to discuss several overarching issues that I believe are key to transforming the Department of Veterans Affairs into a nimble 21st century organization that our veterans can count on when they need it most. Before we dive into the budget, Mr. Secretary, I'm extremely proud that the accountability legislation and appeals reform legislation have already passed the House this Congress with widespread bipartisan support and with your support, I might add. I'm grateful to you, Mr. Secretary, and your team for assisting the committee in both of these efforts, and I look forward to continuing to work together to secure a swift passage of those measures in the Senate this summer. Our next priority is reforming the CHOICE program and in doing so consolidating VA's mini care, uh, mini care and the community programs under a single streamlined CHOICE umbrella. The President's budget uh, demonstrates that CHOICE reform is an administration priority. While the CHOICE program that Congress created three years ago has helped hundreds of thousands of veterans receive care, it is not without problems to say the least. Too many veterans still have trouble getting the care they need when they need it. Too many community providers and VA employees are left confused and frustrated by overly bureaucratic and opaque care in the community processes and procedures. Looking ahead, I want a choice program that empowers veteran patients to make decisions about where and when and how to use the health care benefits they've earned because as a doctor, I can tell you that empowering patients leads to better outcomes, better quality, and more efficient and effective hospitals and clinics. Our veteran service organization partners rightly note, when given the choice to receive care in the community, many veterans remain, uh, choose to remain at VA. For those veterans, we must examine ways to increase access, improve quality, and ensure an appropriate alignment of supply and demand. I look forward to working together to reform the CHOICE program in the coming months. Mr. Secretary, in recent weeks, you've noted that VA has a high number of vacant, underutilized buildings and properties across the country. Using VA's limited resources to secure and maintain empty or largely empty buildings and campuses while so many VA's capital asset projects go unfunded serves no veteran well. I look forward to working with the administration to examine how to right-size VA's physical footprint, physical footprint, ensure taxpayer dollars are spent where our veterans need them most, and explore innovative ways of ensuring that VA is able to maintain a presence in the community. Underlying all of these goals, uh, from achieving faster and more accurate appeals determinations to enhancing VA's relationships with community providers to make better decisions about where to locate clinics and hospitals is a need to modernize information technology systems. I cannot state too strongly the need for VA to invest wisely in IT programs and consider commercial off-the-shelf products that can be quickly put to use solving VA's biggest problems. Finally, I want to note that at 2 o'clock in this very room, the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, led by my friend General Bergman, will conduct a hearing on VA's financial management. That hearing could not come at a better time. 
While I'm grateful for the support and dedication that the administration has shown to our veterans by requesting a multi-billion dollar increase in VA's budget, we must continue to seek ways for VA to be more responsible stewards of the taxpayer dollars. As long as I'm chairman of this committee, I can assure you I will continue to advocate for the resources VA needs to meet our nation's obligations to veterans. However, simply increasing VA's bottom line year after year often results in more bureaucracy, but seldom results in better services for our veterans. Throwing money at a problem rarely makes it go away, and when it does, the solution is often temporary. It's time for VA to take a hard look at how resources are allocated and to make some tough calls about how to best serve our veterans and their families in a budget environment that's not infinite. I want, to help you, I want to help you with that, Mr. Secretary, and look forward to hearing today how this committee can help you transform the VA into a high-performing organization. I know it can be, and I believe our veterans deserve. And interestingly, we just spent about an hour talking about these very things, Mr. Secretary. I, th I think pretty much what I just said, we just said an hour ago over at the Capitol. With that, I'll yield to Ranking Member Walsh for any opening statement that you might have. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. It's good to see you again and uh, really look forward to, uh, to hearing you dive deep into this. As the Chairman said, we've had it for about uh, a day, and, and we've put some long hours uh, combing through it, and I think uh, all of us understand budgets are uh, far more than fiscal documents. They're a reflection of our values. And, um, and I have to say, at, at first blush, the, the 6 percent, uh, we're certainly glad that you did not receive the fate of almost every other agency. Um, and, and that is a good thing. It looks like most of the gross in medical service and community care, um, we're obviously going to have questions on how that's going to be delivered. Um, I am concerned, though, that demand on a system could very well increase in funding because veterans don't live in the bubble we talked about. They and their families and neighbors rely on services from many other federal agencies. My fear is the budget fails to account for the demand on VA care when they're shifted over from other agencies and, and other programs. Uh, this could be changes or elimination of ACA or the impact of reduced budgets would have on HUD-BASH program. Um, I'm interested to hear today on how you interpret what's going to happen with that shift. Uh, yesterday, the House passed a Bipartisan Claims Appeal Modernization Improvement Act. I congratulate uh, the chairman and the entire committee on doing that. Um, really important, though, uh, that the Veterans Benefit Administration and the Board of Veterans Appeal have the resources they need to implement that. Uh, they're receiving some cuts over there, the way we're interpreting this. So we, we want to see that. Um, information technology down $215 million Doesn't give me confidence that the VA will have what it needs to implement this streamlined claim process, but I rely on your expertise to help us with that. Also, I know this is a gorilla in this room, but it's going to have to be addressed. The House passed the bipartisan bill of a one-year COLA without a round-down provision in it um, and to DIC benefits. Congress's intent was clear yesterday, and I believe what was a unanimous vote, to not round down those benefits. Veterans see the round down as a pretty strong uh, repudiation of what they feel they've earned. While rounding down to the nearest dollar, may seem like an insignificant cut, it's going to be viewed that way. So I'd be interested to hear how we talk about that. I'm encouraged by the increase in non-reoccurring maintenance that will allow VA to only, not only maintain its infrastructure, but begin the process of reducing that backlog. Um, we had a talk yesterday, and I appreciate your insights on this, Mr. Secretary. I think you're on the leading edge of how we deal with uh, our, our buildings, our infrastructure, our excess uh, buildings, and, and everything else. And again, looking forward to hearing you talk about how that's going to work. But I think that's uh, a good start. I have concerns on the budget proposals to fund the Veterans Choice Program through mandatory spending, especially in light of repeated quest. Again, I'm going to leave that open to have you and hear from you today, but it appears to lay the foundation for Choice 2.0 and increased non-VA care without a plan yet that has been given to us. So it's going to look like there's a pot of money, mandatory spending. How is it going to happen? Again, you're the expert on this, and you've earned the trust of this committee and veterans to, uh, to be able to implement that. Um, we've heard from veteran service organizations. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. I hope we're going to work together with them as this gets implemented. I know you value that relationship deeply. Um, I, I can say that, that they're concerned, um, but they're also concerned in a positive way. Uh, on a positive note, uh, we're hearing from veterans back home about the National Veteran Cemeteries and, and what it is. We had this talk yesterday. Um, we're not going to rest till everything is covered, but I hear nothing 
but positive comments about our veteran cemeteries. I hear nothing but positive comments about those people who, uh, whose loved ones are buried there. And yesterday, listening to you, Mr. Secretary, have a vision for using those as a resource to educate our children and our, uh, our citizens. Uh, very inspiring. And we want to make sure you have the resources to do exactly that. Again, on the surface, the request isn't bad compared to other agencies. We'll hear from you today. Um, again, I hope that bar is higher than that, but, but I am concerned. But I, I would leave it with asking you today, I know you're in your lane. I know you're in your expertise. But again, I would ask you to give us some assurances that the bleed over from the cuts in the other agencies aren't going to change some of these bottom line numbers and impact on veterans. And, uh, and with that, once again, I thank you uh, for your time, Mr. Secretary, and look forward to your testimony. I yield back. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Walsh. As I mentioned earlier, we are honored to be uh, joined this morning by the Honorable Dr. David Shulkin, Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for being here. Uh, the Secretary is joined at the table by uh, Edward Murray, the Acting Assistant Secretary for Management and Chief Financial Officer. Mark Yow, the Chief Financial Officer for Veterans Health Administrations. Um, Mr. James uh, Manker, the Acting Deputy, uh, Acting Principal Deputy Under Secretary for Benefits. Matthew Sullivan, the uh, Deputy Under Secretary for Finance and Planning and the Chief Financial Officer for the National Cemetery Administration. And Rob Thomas, uh, the Acting Assistant Secretary for Information Technology. Thank all of you all for being here this morning. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you're now recognized for as much time as you may consume. Great. Well, thank you. And um, thank you for introducing my team. You see, I brought a lot of help because uh, we're expecting some good, tough questions this morning. Uh, well, besides good morning, Chairman Rowe and Ranking Member Waltz and other members of the committee, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to spend time talking about the President's 2018 budget and the 2019 advanced appropriations. I also owe you uh, additional thanks to the committee. Uh, yesterday, you all had a very busy day. Seven bills passed for veterans. Thank you, Chairman, for your leadership on that. The most important to us, although they're all important, is um, the appeals modernization. And so thank you very much again for the House's leadership on that important topic. Uh, I also want to thank you for providing VA the full 2017 budget from the very start of the fiscal year. It's been a long time since that's happened, and again, thank you for your support on that. It really speaks well of the House and of the American people that despite the differences that we're seeing going on, that we can come together and uphold our common commitment to caring for, this, for the nation's veterans. Uh, I've submitted a written statement for the record. So what I want to mention is, is that the President's 2018 budget reflects his strong personal commitment to the nation's veterans, providing the resources necessary to continuing our ongoing modernization of VA. It requests $186.5 billion for a VA, $104 billion of that is in mandatory funding, and $82.1 billion in discretionary funding for a total increase of $6.4 billion, or 3.6 percent, over 2017. It provides $3.5 billion in mandatory funds to continue the Veterans Choice Program, plus a 7.1 percent increase in discretionary funding for the Health Administration to improve patient access and timeliness of care. This is the budget that we need to achieve my five priorities as Secretary. Those five priorities are to provide veterans greater choice, to modernize our systems, to focus our resources more efficiently on what matters most to veterans, to improve the timeliness of services in both health administration and in disability and appeals, and then my single clinical priority on reducing veteran suicides. We're already taking bold steps on each of these priorities. Last month, the President signed a reauthorization of the VACA legislation ensuring that veterans can continue to get care from community providers. The President has also ordered the establishment of the VA Accountability Office, and we recently removed two medical center directors and three other senior executive service leaders. We will simply not tolerate employees who act counter to the values that put our veterans at risk. We now have same-day services for primary care and mental health at all of our medical centers. Veterans can now access wait time data for their local VA facilities by using an easy online tool where they can access access where they can get access wait time data 
service or satisfaction data and quality data. No other health system in the country has this type of transparency. A few months ago, the Veterans Crisis Line had a rollover rate to our backup centers of more than 30 percent. Today, that rate is less than 1 percent. We've launched a new predictive modeling tool called ReachVet that allows VA to provide proactive care to veterans who are at higher risk for suicide. And I've also recently announced the VA will provide emergency mental health care to former service, men, uh, for former service members with other than honorable discharges at all of our medical facilities. Thank you in particular to Representative Kaufman who really enlightened me onto this problem. Uh, we know that these veterans are at greater risk for suicide and we are now caring for them uh, wherever we can. These are just a few of the efforts that are underway already improving the lives of veterans, but to keep moving forward, we need your help. We need Congress to help us realign our capital infrastructure, as the chairman mentioned, to dispose of property that we can't use to support uh, veterans that are already uh, being served. We need Congress to fund our IT modernization to keep our legacy systems from failing and to increase the interoperability of electronic health records essential to any high-performing integrated healthcare system. We're now also weighing options for adopting a commercial off-the-shelf system as an alternative to our legacy systems. And I've announced that I'll make a decision on that before July 1st. I've, um, it makes sense to go with an off-the-shelf system uh, but for that, we're going to need additional support. Uh, and by off the shelf, I've said that what I'm really considering is either a outsourced effort to continue Vista or look at it off the shelf, that I want to get VA out of the software development business. We need Congress to authorize the overhaul of our broken and failing claims appeal process. And yesterday, you helped us in a long way towards that. We need the Senate to work with us on that as well. We've worked closely with the VSOs and other stakeholders to draft a proposal to modernize that system. And um, uh, again, we're waiting for the Senate to act. Most of all, we need Congress to ensure the continued success of choice for veterans. More veterans are opting for choice than ever before. Since January 1st of this year, we've authorized 8.2 million community care appointments. That's 2.6 million more than last year or a 46% increase. Thus far this fiscal year, we've authorized 18,000 more choice appointments per business day than in fiscal year 16. We've charted a course for modernization and are already moving forward, but we need your help to keep up with the choice program's growth, maintain a momentum, and make our community care plan a reality for all veterans for generations to come. Thank you, and we look forward to any questions you have about the budget today. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'll, I will. Uh yield myself five minutes and start the question. How, how does this request for continued uh, choice program funding fit with your plans to reform and revamp the choice program? Well, um, first of all, as I said, we're very um, pleased to see the President's budget. We think it gives us the resources necessary to modernize the system. Part of modernizing the system is learning from our experience with choice over the past three years. And all of you have been very active in giving us feedback that while we're seeing the CHOICE program working better than it had before, uh, it still is too complex a system. It's filled with bureaucracy. Our veterans don't understand it. Our staff don't understand it. So with all that feedback and working with our VSOs and other veterans groups, we've been working on redesigning a program that we want to present to all of you in approximately about 10 days now that we believe is going to work better for veterans. And the basic issue is, is that we want to change it from being an administrative system that is based upon being 40 miles away from a primary care provider and an administrative system based on 30 days or more of wait time to being a clinical system that actually meets the clinical needs of the veterans that we serve. We believe we have a way of doing this and we believe that we'll do it within the budget that the president has proposed. And I think uh, we'll, we'll obviously hold a hearing on choice, but just very briefly, uh, would it be where you are looking at a, basically a panel of physicians, just like you would have in the private sector, where you could use the best of the private world and the public world, because there's not an unlimited group of uh, providers out there. I mean, we're finding shortages on the private sector. I was riding to, uh, into the office this morning, 
And on satellite radio, I heard my hospital system in Johnson City, Tennessee, that hospital system advertising for nurses wow. here in Washington, D.C. And so that's a problem nationwide. And so I think we're going to have to marry the best of both the VA world and the private sector to provide the quality care that you've talked about. Is that something you have in mind? Yeah. When we talk about a highly integrated um, high performance system, it's exactly what we're talking about, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we believe that's what veterans want. They want a strong VA, and it's our job to make sure that we are providing the best services in the VA. But the VA can't do it alone. And that's what we learned in the 2014 wait time crisis, that we have to work with the private sector. Right now, about a third of all care in the VA is being delivered in the private sector. We want to make sure that when a veteran goes outside, that they're getting the best care, and when they stay inside the VA, two-thirds of the time, they're getting the best care. So it's exactly what we're aiming for. You know, we had a little, uh, a little uh, it wasn't an October surprise, but we had a little surprise about a year and a half ago, and, and I guess one of the things the committee will want to know, uh, both sides of the aisle, can, can you assure the committee that the additional funding requested in this budget submission that VA's care in the community programs will be fully funded for fiscal year 18 and 19, because we had a big shortfall, if you remember. Yeah, the problem that we had about uh, almost almost two years ago, but but you know it sort of was coming to the height 18 months ago, was that we actually had enough money in the community care program. It's just that they were in two separate checking accounts, and we needed to have your authority to mix the money in the checking accounts. We had run out of money in the traditional community care programs, but the CHOICE program, uh, we hadn't tapped a large amount of that money. What we're going to be seeking from you uh, and working with you on is trying to have one pot of money for community care for veterans. And that way we simplify the system and we do not repeat the mistakes of history of essentially not spending correctly out of two checking accounts. One last question very quickly. Uh, does this budget request account for the new Office of Accountability and Whistleblower Protection as well as the director that will oversee the function of this office that was recently created by the President's executive order? Well, ahead of schedule, because this is such a priority for me, we have named a director and we have started to put this office together. Uh, so we're not waiting until we have to do it. We're doing it proactively. Uh, I am trying to, uh, there was no new funds authorized for this, so of course uh, my, my biggest uh, intent is to make sure that this office has a big impact, but also trying to do it to uh, make sure that taxpayers are getting the best value. So I'm trying to use it from current resources and not try to expend uh, ad uh, additional resources, but uh, we will uh, make sure that we fund this from within our current budget allocation. Good. My time's expired. Mr. Walsh, you're recognized. We are going to uh, defer on our side down to, uh, to Mr. Peters. Um, I do that out of uh, empathy, having occupied what is affectionately the Walls chair for 10 years. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you may go first and we'll work this way. Mr. Peters. How great is that? I look forward to this every hearing. So <laughs> This wouldn't happen in every committee, by the way. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ranking Member. Um, thank you, Secretary Shulkin, for coming to see us. And in San Diego, as you know, we have, a, I think, over 230,000 veterans in our, in our county, uh, which is a rich population and a terrific, uh, terrific resource for us. We have a lot of issues like fixing the appeals process, which we're really happy with the progress on that, addressing uh, some schedule issues, getting the right medical staff at the VA, fixing the IT system, uh, trying to rec reconcile the, the, the Department of Defense system with the veteran system. Um, I wanted to ask a question, though, about homelessness, because uh, San Diego, I think, has, I think, the fifth largest population of homeless people in absolute numbers, and because of the nature of our population, so many of them are veterans. And as I think I mentioned to you yesterday, I'm pleased to see the, the support for vouchers going forward. Um, we have two issues in San Diego, where one is um, we have very, very high rents, and so it's hard for us to, um, to get the same bang for our buck as other communities for the, for the vouchers. And let me be introduce, you could, you could um, address that a little bit, but really uh, the other side of this is because um, you know, all the effects for veterans aren't on this budget, and in particular the housing and urban development budget has been hammered. 
and um, the proposal is really to cut a lot of the support for homelessness. So while we see generally support, even maybe even a little more support directly in the Veterans Affairs budget, uh, I'm concerned we're going to be playing whack-a-mole because um, of what's happening in the, in the HUD budget. Can you address that? How, how can we be assured that the, the, the rug's not really going to be taken out from underneath veterans on homelessness? Well, um, thank you for raising this as an issue. This is extremely important for us, and this is an area that we know that we're doing the right thing, that we're making progress on. We've reduced veterans' homelessness since 2010 by 46 percent. Last year, we had the biggest impact ever, a 17 percent reduction in veterans' homelessness, and we continue to see community after community declare an end to chronic veteran homelessness. Uh, but there are parts of the country, California in particular, that continue to uh, hold the majority of the issues. Uh, San Diego is a big area. LA, of course, is even, is even bigger. Um, this budget for VA not only continues to allow us to make the type of progress we did last year, but it actually adds $605 million more to allow us to accelerate our, um, our progress, and we're going to continue to do that. I think you're right. Uh, many of the things that we do in VA requires interagency cooperation. HUD has been a terrific partner for us, and of course we are concerned if they're going to be able to continue that. Uh, while I can't speak for the Department of, of uh, Housing and Urban Development, I have reached out to Secretary Carson, and I've expressed uh, my concern as well. He has assured me that he remains committed to being the type of partner that HUD has in the past, that he understands that veterans are uh, a very important part uh, of the community and important to the American people. So I expect that we will see that same type of commitment that we have in the past from HUD. Well, again, I appreciate you reaching out to him. And yep. um, obviously, uh, we're happy to hear that. We'll need to hear from him uh, yep. also. And I think, frankly, if the, if the budget proceeds for HUD the way it is, he's going to be pretty constrained. The other off-budget thing I'd mention, too, is with respect to IT, we really ought to coordinate with the Department of Defense. They got a nice boost uh, in the proposed budget. I think w what many of us think that that's appropriate. I served on armed services for my first two terms. Uh, but the, the glaring mismatch between uh, the t two systems, you know, a, a young person enlists uh, when they're 18, and, and um, there's no reason why they can't continue on with the same uh, in the same continuum of, health, of system uh, all the way till, till ultimately they, um, they pass away. Uh, and finally, I wanted to mention on the cemeteries, um, Mr. Walls mentioned uh, how terrific that is. I just want to thank personally uh, your staff for uh, an open house we did at Miramar National Cemetery uh, this past weekend. We are trying to let people know that Rosecrans is full. Obviously, that's one of the jewels of the system. We have a beautiful facility at Miramar, and I want to thank uh, Brad Phillips and Rex Kern of your staff for helping us introduce that to the veteran community in San Diego, and, uh, and we look forward to working with you on these and other issues well, throughout the year. Well, th thank, thank you for all those comments. They, um, first of all, uh, our cemetery doesn't get the recognition that it deserves, so thank you for doing that. And as we approach Memorial Day, um, these are terrific uh, places that have great um, ceremonies planned to honor those who have passed away and um, have served the country. So thank you for mentioning that, and uh, we'll, we'll make sure that they uh, hear your acknowledgement Great. of their appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Jim. Yellow. Mr. Coppin, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, uh, your announcement about uh, providing uh, urgent mental health services to former service members with other than um, honorable discharges. Uh, does the VA intend to use existing funds to provide this care uh, to these veterans, or does VA require additional funding? Um, there is an additional cost to providing uh, these services to members that hadn't previously received services, and we have quantified that, but I have said that there is no higher priority, and so we will do this within the funding that the President has proposed. Uh, I believe that uh, you continue to advocate sure. for broader uh, service coverage, something that I support very much, uh, but with that, there 
will be additional costs, and we would also appreciate consideration of additional appropriations for those services. But uh, we are not going to let uh, the fact that there is not additional monies right now prevent us from offering these services. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, Mr. Secretary, the, uh, um, on uh, the, the construction side, uh, obviously there were uh, some significant problems uh, in that area as noted in the uh, construction project uh, in the, the state of Colorado in uh, Aurora in the, the VA replacement uh, uh, center there. Um, what, what, tell us about your path going forward and what lessons have you learned from that yeah. particular project? Well, um, you know, I think, I think, again, you've been instrumental in, in highlighting that this project uh, it, it was just unacceptable and the, the cost overruns uh, almost in, inexplainable. Uh, fortunately, uh, this is a project that will be completed, thanks again to your support, and it appears to be on time and uh, there will be no additional funds requested to, to complete this project. But we will never again have a project like that in VA. Um, it just simply is irresponsible. Uh, we've changed our processes, of course, as you know, the, Cor the Corps of Army Engineers is now involved, uh, and we've learned uh, in root cause analyses why that project was such a, uh, a cost overrun. Uh, in this budget, we are not proposing any major construction projects like that, I think we have to think about doing business differently. Healthcare is changing. Uh, it's, not, it's no longer, I think the chairman makes this point, we used to require large, large buildings with inpatient capacity, now are becoming far more ambulatory in nature. We recently had a project in Omaha, Nebraska that we just announced, which is a new model for building, which is an ambulatory building that is a private-public partnership actually allows for donations from the community and builds at different standards. So I think that's the model we're going to want to look at going forward to get more value for veterans and taxpayers. Mr. Secretary, you recently stated the VA has identified more than uh, 430 vacant uh, buildings and 735 underutilized buildings that cost the government uh, $25 million a year. Uh, how do you intend to address the issue of unused VA facilities uh, without greatly impacting uh, veterans' access to health care? Well, the facilities that are uh, vacant and underutilized uh, are not currently taking care of veterans. They are either they're, they're vacant buildings or they're being used for non-clinical services like storing engineering equipment or, or uh, or, or other types of storage facilities. So we believe that these 1,100 facilities uh, could, uh, could essentially be consolidated or eliminated and not impact veteran care at all. In fact, be able to use the money that we're using to maintain them and heat them and put that money back into veteran services. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Ms. Esty, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Waltz. And again, I want to thank the Secretary and his team for working so hard with us. And this committee worked very hard, and my, uh, my subcommittee chairman, uh, Mr. Bost, and I think we have a very good bill, not perfect, mm -hmm. uh, but a very good bill to pass on to the Senate and hopefully move across the finish line. But I really do want to emphasize that we're really not across the finish line until this bill is implemented. The appeals bill needs to be implemented. And I not only need your commitment, but I'm a little concerned looking at the budget that those IT funds are actually cut. We're now establishing, if this bill gets, as we hope, signed into law, we're going to have a new system. We're going to have three tiers. So number one, how are we going to ensure we have the IT resources? Yep. Number two, what are we going to do about the, how we track the legacy claims? So those are the first two I'd like your, your thoughts on. Yeah. So um, thank, thank you for, for, for asking those questions. Uh, first of all, the appeals legislation, uh, very, very important. But I want to be clear, it solves the appeals issue going forward. It does not address the backlog, which is considerable. Today it takes a veteran they file an appeal six years before they're going to get an answer on average. So uh, 
I want to make sure that everyone understands what we're solving and what we're not. We're solving going forward, but we still have a backlog issue. On the IT issue, what I think you're seeing in this budget is a recognition that we do not want to continue to ask for more money and invest more money in fixing broken systems. We are not done with IT. We're going to need to come back to you after I announce a direction by July 1st to be able to talk to you about what really needs to be done in modernizing our IT systems. So this budget, the one area that I would tell you that we have not yet accounted for is the modernization of the IT system. But we did not want to continue to keep on asking for more money. So you're seeing a reduction in IT services and that's the explanation. Well, thank you. That's an important clarification for us to understand yes. that you expect to come back to us and obviously we're going to need procurement reform to facilitate this process. So I hope when you get to that point, we can work together on that. Um, I'm concerned because I'm seeing a decrease in the funding on the research budget um, for medical and prosthetic research. The reason I flag that is because we know as a factual matter that our veterans are returning home now with more profound injuries than in the past. The research done by the VA is extraordinarily important for these veterans and frankly for all Americans because of that research carries benefits for Americans more broadly. How can we be assured that veterans are continuing to receive the kind of support they need when that research component is getting cut? Well, um, I, you know, I am in agreement with you that the VA is the only organization whose research focuses solely on improving the well-being of veterans. And the research that VA has done over the years has led to not only important advances for veterans, but for all Americans. And um, many of the things that we all rely upon came out of VA research. So uh, I do not uh, intend for this budget to be any type of messaging that VA research is not important, not critical, that we do want to continue to invest in this. We are working with our researchers right now to seek additional extra mural funding to work with the NIH. I've spoken to Francis Collins about uh, working closer to uh, have our research programs work together and we're seeking to make sure that our research program grows. But this budget shows uh, some fiscal constraint on the area of research, and uh, we will make sure and keep an eye on that to make sure this is a strong program. Thank you. I think that will be particularly important, and you and I have discussed before with the Deborah Sampson Act and needing to address women veteran specific issues, and if that funding is cut, we, we have some risks there. The last thing I want to quickly flag is we've had some issues in the Hartford office in Connecticut with the VRE, with the Vocational Rehabilitation and Employment um, Services. We're just, there's more demand than there is ability to accommodate. Um, love to get work with you after this. Um, and also to flag, this may be an issue in other districts too. We may not be alone. We want our veterans to get rehabilitated. We want them to be employed. And that is the wrong place we should be looking to cut because in fact, that is what they deserve, that opportunity. So thank you thank and you. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady for yielding. Dr. Dunn, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, I see the VA funding for mental health uh, has increased by $473 million for 2000, from 2017, uh, and that expands inpatient, residential, outpatient treatment. Does any of that additional funding include money geared towards research on traumatic brain injury and other psychological disorders like depression? Yeah. Um, uh, this, what, what you've noted is uh, an increase in our discretionary funding. So that's on the clinical side. Our research allocation is different. We have, over the past uh, nine years, increased our research uh, funding for TBI and other, uh, and other brain injuries uh, by about tenfold. We now have uh, well over 100 different research projects going on on TBI. And this is one of the areas of focus. We just came back last week from a <laughs> summit in Boston called the Brain Trust, where we focused on not only VA, but other federal organizations and community organizations to enhance the research in TBI. And one of the real calls to action was to develop a biomarker 
so that we could track progress in TBI and post-traumatic stress in particular. Thank you. I look forward to following that with you. Uh, yesterday, we passed 2288 uh, in the House, and there's strong bipartisan support for that and in the VSOs. Uh, but there is a concern that the, the veterans who are in the current appeals process rather than the new appeals process will languish, perhaps not get the, their, their appeals may be slowed down because of that. Can you address that concern? Yeah. Um, I don't believe that the appeals will slow down. Uh, we're talking about now the backlog of appeals. Yes, yes sir. Right. Exactly. I don't believe current that appeals. Yeah, current appeals. I don't believe that they'll slow down, but I don't be believe that they'll particularly speed up either. Uh, so that was yeah. my next question. Yeah. You, you don't, can you say if we pass this current budget as proposed, yes. does that address to some de degree the delays that we're looking at? No, and, and, and I don't have good news for you on that. I think that it would take until I believe 2026 to, with the current uh, allocation of funds, to be able to work off that backlog. And I think that that's really too long. Uh, but uh, I don't have a better answer for you right now on the backlog, thanks to what you've done. And if the Senate passes that, uh, we will fix going forward. But the backlog would take a new, uh, uh, injection of funding to be able to hire more lawyers and more support staff. Maybe we could change the off. system instead. I mean, I don't just see. That, well, I think I think we really do have to look at that. We'll work with you on that. I, you. I think you have some great ideas. Well, let me ask, uh, squeeze in one last question here. Uh, can you tell us about your future plans to update the processing system for the post 911 GI Bill rights? the educational rights, and, and what efforts were going to sort of streamline that, because th that system is really bogged down. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to have uh, Mr. Manker talk about that. So, so thank you for that question. The, the long-term solutions, we call it, for Post 9-11 and Chapter 33, we're processing claims, we're reaching our strategic targets now with respect to processing claims. We have two times during the year, during the spring enrollment and the fall enrollment, where it slows down a little, but still we're hitting uh, claim, supplemental claims within about uh, seven to eight days. Uh, I, I, that's not been my experience. I'd love to work with your office on that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm 60 days into a claim, so okay. We, okay. we want to address that. I, Absolutely. Uh, I think that on the ground, it feels like it's a lot longer. Yes, sir. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Mr. O'Rourke, you recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your service. Uh, especially in the time where we first got to know you as Undersecretary for VHA and all the changes and improvements that you made in that time and uh, your commitment to working with us in improving care and service delivery to veterans in the short time that you've been Secretary. And I'm grateful to the President for making this selection and, and for the Senate in confirming you unanimously. Um, let me take one of the, the best parts of your opening statement, uh, which is the fact that you are the first Secretary that I know of that has made suicide reduction and prevention a top priority. And, and the fact that you call it out and call it by its name is so incredibly important for us getting from what I think you have officially measured as 20 veteran suicides every single day in this country to uh, a number that is far lower than that. Uh, many of these are preventable deaths. Um, I am grateful for the fact that you are now helping other than honorable uh, discharged veterans in emergency situations. But if, as you say, there is no higher priority, and if this really is uh, something that you want to make a difference on, that is, that is absolutely not going to be enough. Let me, let me give you these facts by context. From 2011 through 2015, 13,283 veterans received an other than honorable discharge who had, uh, within the two years prior to separation, post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, or certain other conditions that could be associated with misconduct. Unless they're in an emergency situation, I'm gonna kill myself, I need some help, and they go to an emergency room, we're not helping them now. We're not giving them the preventative care that is going to ensure that we don't find ourselves and that they don't find themselves and their families don't find them in these kind of situations. So I urge you to do everything you can administratively, and I think you can do more. And I urge my colleagues to take the next step to build on what Mr. Kaufman has done and support the Honoring Our Commitment Act that I introduced with Mr. Bost in the House 
uh, Mr. Peters, and then in the Senate, uh, Mr. Murphy. Would like to get your comments on that and whether or not you are committed to serving all other than honorable discharge veterans who need that help from our country. Uh, well, you know, um, if anything, um, Congressman, you've been consistent as an as a advocate on mental health and the fact that VA can do better. And you've usually been right, uh, maybe always been right on these issues. So I will um, take you up on your ask that I relook at everything that we can do administratively. Um, I felt like it was important to act quickly and I felt that I had the authority to take the actions that I have. But if there's more that we can do, we will. I also appreciate you recognizing that your ability to legislate on this is extremely important and would assure that we have the authorities that we need to be able to do this. This is critically important. Um, and this is a matter of saving lives. So we take it really seriously and appreciate you continuing to be such a strong advocate. Great. So, so we, will, we will both commit yep. to pursuing this. You administratively, you will take it as far as you can. That's what I hear. We have the re responsibility to legislate that if you cannot get all the way there uh, on your own through the administration. Yes. So I'm asking my colleagues who are here today uh, to join me on this, the chairman to make this a priority uh, and make sure that we can, we can move forward on this. Uh, two other quick points. Um, you clarified your um, commitment to purchasing a uh, commercial off-the-shelf software. I think a lot of people perked up when you said that that could be interpreted to mean either what I think of a commercial off-the-shelf system, which is a commercial off-the-shelf system, or more Vista just programmed by somebody outside of, of the VA. I, I really hope that, that it will be the former, that, that you will pick the, the best system, the best practices, um, that are used in, in the best systems in, in the country uh, instead of trying to build upon VISTA, which you've acknowledged is an ancient, antiquated system that that's, you know, uh, costs us more to maintain than, than in the value that we get out of that. Uh, and the other point I would make, and this may be just my interpretation, is you said that you did not request more in IT spending because you don't yet have a plan. But it seems like we're, we're requesting more for choice spending without fully understanding how we're going to improve the choice system. So I just commit to you, uh, you know, I want to work with you to make sure that we have the controls in place to get better outcomes for choice before we spend uh, billions more on, on that process. So uh, thank you for that. I'm out of time. So uh, may take your response on both of those for the record. Thank you. Thanks. General Bergman, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Secretary Shulkin. I, I applaud you and the VA for your statement earlier about your decision to get out of the software development business. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, that shows signs that the, the, the vision has a future. You've testified several times about the medical appointment scheduling system, MASS, uh, which is you know, the VA's long-term solution to, to scheduling uh, issues. The MASS contract was initially awarded in August of 2015, then all work was suspended in early 16. Uh, it was announced that it was being reactivated in January as a pilot at one site. Um, nothing has happened. No task orders uh, have been awarded. Can you, can you give us an update or explain what's happening with Mass? Yeah. Um, so uh, the VA actually has uh, four different scheduling uh, things going on right now. Our current scheduling system, which is based off of a DOS-based system that most of our schedulers use, we have uh, a homegrown system being rolled out called VSE for Veteran Scheduling Enhancements, the MASS pilot at one site, as you mentioned, and then recently uh, a, a uh, new um, bill that was passed requiring that we pilot a off-the-shelf uh, scheduling system. And so we just awarded that contract. In terms of the MASS contract, a, uh, a award will be announced um, Mark, do you remember when that is? Okay, so uh, in the next in the next couple of weeks to proceed forward with the pilot site, uh, and a lot of pre work has been done on that. But the mass scheduling system was awarded because that is the uh, most tested off the shelf system that's available, and so that's why we're proceeding with our pilot site. 
Well, you know, it doesn't necessarily seem, because we've talked about the, the backlogs and delays, that uh, I'm not feeling the aggressive nature here of moving forward with getting a solution. Uh, um, you've got a, one from three sites to one site. Um, mm -hmm. This is largely fixed costs in this piloting. Is there any reason that we cannot, we cannot uh, in surge, if you will? Uh, bottom line is we've got time we can't recover, but we can surge assets to develop data quicker. Is that a possibility? What am I missing? Well, we, we the original plan with the mass uh, program was, was three pilots for $57 million. I did not believe that that was an appropriate use of taxpayers' money. So we've gone back and we've narrowed that down to a much smaller amount of money. I believe it's now $6 million for the single pilot site. That will build all the interfaces that we need so that we can, if that is successful, then begin a much quicker rollout. And so what we're trying to do is to make sure that we're not throwing money out. We want to show, we want to be able to demonstrate that we can build the interfaces, that it works for our schedulers, that it works for veterans. And as soon as we have shown that, and that's why this award will happen in the next two weeks, uh, then we can surge that and accelerate it throughout the country. Well, again, I, I, I applaud you because you, you took a $57 million number and reduced it. Good on you. Um, sounds like the timelines are moving forward. Uh, I'd like to go, and we only got a minute here, but it's probably more of a comment than a question because you and I had a chance to chat a little bit about this yesterday. But in the military, we're in the, when we're in the fight, we have the assets we have, and we redistribute and redeploy them as we need as the, the, the fronts of the fight appear. Regarding the appeals, uh, what I heard said this morning here was hire more lawyers. That concerns me. Don't we have enough folks that are currently working in the Veterans Affairs bureaucracy that you could consider, strongly consider, redeploying already existing assets in a short term to re in increase the rate of reduction of the backlog in the appeals process? Yeah. I, I am, uh, am going to tell you as honestly as I can that I don't believe that we've done enough to consider what you've just, what you just asked. Uh, it's been suggested to us to bring back retired judges who are already trained in veterans law. Uh, we've suggested that and internally that, that has not been well accepted. Uh, I believe that we owe you a much better answer on this. I think that we need to do better. I wish I knew what that was today. Uh, but I want to work with you. If you have ideas on how to do this, uh, I think we owe you a better answer. Thank you. I do, and I yield back. I know I'm over my time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Gen General. And I want to apologize to Mr. Sablon. I'm going to add five minutes to, the, to our meeting this afternoon <laughs> to apologize. We, we have a meeting. But I, I'm going to ask that Ms. Brownlee be given uh, five minutes now, and then I think she has to leave. Okay, Mr. Sablon's up then. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, we'll, we should do this more often, actually. Uh, but, um, Mr. Secretary, it's, thank you. Welcome again, and thank you for your service. And um, I, I have just basically two questions now. Um, on, on recruitment and retention of health care providers, um, all of us here are hearing of shortage, shortages of health care providers around the country. Um, and as you and I had discussed before, in my district, there's one private physician, uh, and so there is a need for, for uh, more health care providers. But do you believe your budget includes the resources necessary to successfully recruit? And, um, and after you recruit to retain the health care professionals, you need to provide care to veterans? Um. I think we have a lot of work to do on recruitment. We have a big clinical need, uh, particularly in parts of the country that are rural or isolated, like certainly where, where you represent. We talked about that yesterday. I think our recruitment issues stem from an overall national health care shortage, particularly in primary care and mental health. 
They result from the bad morale and the press that we've been under for the past three years where people say, why would I want to go work for VA? And what we're trying now to do is to change the dialogue on that, that this is one of the best places in the country to serve, that it is a truly remarkable system and people should give it a chance. Our hiring practices are too slow, so we lose good candidates when they get offers from private sector places. And finally, in many situations, our salaries just aren't competitive. So this is a multifactorial issue that we have to address. I can tell you it is at the very top of our list to make sure that we are filling the vacancies that we need. It's one of the reasons why we gave full practice authority to advance practice nurses so that we could get other types of healthcare professionals to come into the VA. Uh, but we're working on this and we still have a ways to go. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Secretary, and this has been brought up, um, discussed in just today's hearing, but um, let me explain it out again so I could fully, more fully understand it. You've talked about the VA's plans to provide emergency health services to veterans who have other than honor Buddhist charges. Now, how does this connect to your overall suicide prevention strategy? When you look at um, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons, and, and, and this gets to Congresswoman Etsy's uh, point about the value of our research, the VA has studied the issue of suicide uh, in, in a way that no other organization has in the country. So we know a lot about where the suicides are happening. They're happening among our older veterans in largest numbers, but the fastest growing groups are among younger veterans and the very fastest group among women veterans. And when you start looking at subgroups, those that are homeless and those that are other than honorably discharged who don't have access to the proper healthcare services, including mental health, are at extreme risk. So if we really want to prevent suicides, we have to get to homeless veterans, we have to get to veterans that don't have health care services like other than honorably, and we have to begin to start understanding better the issues with women veterans and the younger veterans, and design our services to be different. So we took an action on other than honorably we're working hard on homelessness, and we're trying to understand how we can do better in those other high-risk populations. Thank you, General Yielding. Uh, Mr. Bilirakis, you recognize. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And thank you again, uh, Mr. Secretary. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thanks for the roundtable yesterday, too, the bipartisan roundtable thank discussion. You. Very productive, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Mr. Secretary, on the Choice Act, uh, I assume that the, the mental health services, veterans, if they qualify for the CHORSA Act, though, they qualify, uh, they have access to mental health services in the community. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. How about uh, uh, veterans who qualify for, uh, for dental care? I know it's, we need to expand that, but 100% uh, uh, if the, it's combat related. Uh, do they have access to, uh, under the CHOICE Act? Um, certainly, if they meet the requirements in terms of currently right now uh, wait times or the services not offered, they can use non-community care. Correct. Yeah. And they, we do a fair can. amount of that. Yeah. So they can. Yes. All right. Very good. Uh, the, the other thing is, uh, Mr. Secretary, on the, on the COVER Act again, yes. we talked about it at the roundtable, the presidential appointees. Right. Uh, so that right. we can start. We, we, we uh, um, this morning, my chief and staff and I uh, are going to be identifying uh, two candidates to recommend to the president to appoint to that. Thank you. The sooner the better. So yes. We can get started. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us on that. This has to do with the alternative therapies. Absolutely. You know. Very important. Okay. Uh, and then uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Dunn as well, um, a, a fellow a Floridian who brought up the post 9 11 GI Bill claims. Uh, and efforts to automate the certificate of eligibility. I have a bill that, uh, that I filed, uh, H.R. 1994, the Vocational Education and Training Enhancement for Reintegration Assistance Act, uh, called the Veterans Act. Can you work with me on that? Because this helps address that issue. Uh, and uh, I'd like for, if you could review that bill and have some yeah. suggestions have as seen? well have with regard to the okay. post 9-11. Absolutely, we'd be okay. delighted to. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, one more question. 
Uh, the budget request main, uh, maintains the, uh, the IG funding uh, as the same as fiscal year uh, 2017. Uh, I continue to hear from veterans by, uh, to investigate uh, claims for negligence and retaliation against whistleblowers. Uh, do you believe the IG has sufficient resources to investigate the amounts of claims they receive? Yeah, um, I, I, um, I may need some, some correction on this. I thought the IG got a substantial increase mm. in, in, in FTEs. But I hope, was, I hope you're was right. There, was there increase last year? They, they were going to hire 200 new uh, employees, I thought. They got an increase last year. But they got flat, so, uh, flat funded. It was, last, it was last fiscal year in 17, they got an increase of, of a couple hundred employees. So, so that was maintained in the president's budget, but no additional increase. No additional increase. Right, yeah. right. Do you still think hiring. that's enough funding uh, for the IG office as far yes. as the, the Yes, I've met, uh, I've met with the IG, uh, and I know that he is hiring up to those levels now. There was a hiring freeze, and that, uh, that delayed some of that hiring. And we're working with the IG actually to find additional space so that he can house the people when he hires them. Okay, very good. Thank you. I want to continue to work with you on that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone like my time? Mr. Chairman, you want my time? No, I'm fine. Okay. All right, I'll yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Custer, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary, for being with us with your team. Um, I want to start by referring to a report today in the Washington Post from the FDA on opioids and just a rather astonishing uh, fact from a study. After one day of opioid use, 6% six, six of people will still use opioids one year later. After 30 days use, 35% will still be using opioids one year later. And it's rather extraordinary, and I wanted to follow up on the cuts in the research budget because I'm grateful for you having chosen opioid addiction as one of your areas of uh, most importance at this point. Um, but we have a great deal to learn about uh, pain management, and I know that there are cutting edge efforts being made in the VA, but I want to make sure that we spread those across the country. What can you say based upon the budget and any other plans that you have to reduce the use of opioid medication and provide for alternative pain management in the VA? Well, I, uh, first of all, those are, those are astonishing statistics and very, very scary. Um, they really reinforce the fact that before we prescribe these medications, we really have to make sure that we're considering alternatives because a, a, a day's treatment with, with that type of um, statistic a year later is, is pretty scary. Um, the VA, as you know, has been focusing on this prior to this becoming an American public health issue. Uh, we have seen a 33% reduction since 2010 in the use of opioids. And in some areas, like in your VA, 50% uh, reduction, my understanding is. And so we have a lot to learn. I recently published an article with my colleagues at VA in the Journal of the American Medical Association this January on what VA is doing, because we believe we're, we have a lot to show and to teach the rest of American medicine about this multifaceted approach towards reducing opioid use. Yesterday, you passed a bill in the House for prescription drug monitoring, and we are very supportive of that and appreciate that, because that's part of um, what we think is important. So we will continue to focus on this. The use of complementary therapies, as you're showing, um, is very, very important as an alternative. The DOD VA guidelines, which are a stepwise approach towards pain management, are important, and as you mentioned, research is critical. We have reached out to the FDA because we want VA to be one of the leaders in finding a non-addictive pain medication that will really begin to start dramatically limiting the use of opioids. Good, and we'd like to work with you. And in particular, I'd like to take these new pain management techniques and make sure they're available in VAs all across yes. the country. So we'll follow up on that. 
Um, with regard to the IT funding, I want to focus in uh, with my colleague, um, General Bergman's comments about the scheduling. Um, in particular, uh, two items with regard to uh, your determination of an effective scheduling system going forward. One is whether you're considering um, what's now widely available in the private sector, which is self-selecting, and number two, any other methods to determine efficiency of scheduling. We have a dramatic problem all across the VA in missed appointments. And part of this is that the appointments they get are not until August because we have such an inefficient scheduling system. And so I think we really need to be focused on reducing those wait times by giving people the times when they can get a ride, when they have a family member that can get them to the VA, um, when they have access to public transportation. So is there anything in this, and I'm, I'm very, very worried, by the way, about the lack of IT funding in this budget. I'm more encouraged that you said you're going to come back. We need to work with you in a bipartisan way with our appropriations colleagues because they may not be in the mood. You know, this is the budget mm -hmm. season and you're mm -hmm. going to come back on your time frame after your decision mm -hmm. and they may very well say, no, no, we've moved on to giving massive tax cuts. We don't have the funds. So those two questions, if you would, Yeah. in I, six seconds. Okay. I, <laughs> I, think, I think it's all legitimate. First of all, when I got to the VA, we were using a system called recall reminders, which is we wouldn't tell the veteran when their appointment was. We would send them a letter in the mail saying, here's when you should come. Uh, we are stopping that practice. That doesn't work. I've never seen it anywhere else. And veterans need to know when their appointments are, and they need to be involved in the decision for the reasons you said. Our no-show rates are far too high, and that's really something that we are targeting to get down. Uh, secondly, we do have a system of self-scheduling called VAR, Veterans uh, Appointment um, Request, which is a self-scheduling system. It is now available, I think, at 104 sites, but uh, really in pilot test, and it will roll out this summer so that veterans can start using that in much larger numbers. And, um, and We'll work with you. Yeah. I need to Thank yield you. back. But we, we will work with our colleagues to make sure you get the IT funding Thank you, you need if you make the right decision. Yes. Good luck. <laughs> thank you, gentlelady, for yielding. Uh, Mr. Pollock, when you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And thank you, Mr. Shokin. Good yeah. to see you again. Appreciate Good it very much. Now, I know you can't have favorites, but we know the state of Maine is your favorite state in the union. And as a result, all 66,000 veterans we have in Maine 2nd District are your favorite. Um, with that said, sir, I want to thank you, and I appreciate very much are you working with us to make sure the $23 million that the VA owed to two of our hospitals in Maine, Eastern Maine Medical Center in Bangor, my district, and Maine Medical in Portland, not my district, but you've done a great job catching up and paying those claims. And I want to thank you and your terrific chief of staff, whose name I have a hard time pronouncing. Uh, help me out with it. Vivica. Vivica, Vivica Wright terrific. That we met with yesterday. Was it was right. this morning? Yes. Yesterday morning. This morning. Yesterday, yesterday. morning. In any event, when we reported to you that we have another one of our yes. hospitals, Callis Regional Hospital, way down East yes. Maine, highly rural. They just closed a unit because of, uh, of other issues they have there, and they're owed half a million dollars by you folks. It's 120 days late, and I know you've committed to work with us on that. And you've, in, in, in addition to that, asked us when we hear additional problems with late payments, you'll be on top. So thank you very much, Mr. Chokin. I appreciate it. Yep. yep. Now. Um, we all know, because it's been discussed here, Mr. Chairman, that uh, going forward, as our WW2 and career veterans continue to age, that the absolute number of veterans that we'll be caring for going forward will drop. At the same time, the budget for the VA over the last six years, and this has been mentioned several times in, in, in hearings the last few months, uh, in the last six years has gone up 50%. So, my concern is how do we get every possible dollar that we have available clinically to help our veterans if they need a knee replacement or they have, or they have PTSD? Now, let's talk a little bit about the IT system here, if I can, Mr. Shulkin. Um, now, it's been said time and time again we had a real problem with it. We have a problem with scheduling. We have a problem with paying claims. Uh, we have a problem with sharing medical records. So the IT system doesn't work, and it's about 30 years old. 
Who on your staff was there at the time these decisions were made? Uh, which, which, which decisions are we talking about? Well, I'm, 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 lo I'm looking at, the, if yeah. I may, I'm yeah. looking at the whole IT system problem. I have a little bit of experience in the software business. You're not in the software business. You don't want to be in the software business. You want to take care of right. veterans. I understand that, and I agree with that. I want to know who among your senior staff, maybe some folks sitting at the table, who anybody involved yes. in those decisions to build an IT system internally that does not work? Why is it taking you this long to say there's got to be a better way to do it? Who at the VA has made that decision and are they with you today? Well, I, I think that this is a decision that has been passed down uh, over many, many administrations and many secretaries. Uh, we do have with us our acting chief information officer, but I don't think that you can look to him to, to uh, say that he was in the position that was accountable. At are, that time. are there any folks at the VA now, uh, Mr. Secretary, who will be involved in this decision to go off shelf to buy a system that will work so we can save money for our veterans clinically and we're not in the business of software? Are there any folks at the VA now that will be making that decision that have been involved in prior decisions? Uh, I am making that decision. I have said that this will be a decision I will make by July 1st, and I was not involved. Okay. How can you assure this committee that is looking to help you, Mr. Secretary, to make sure that we don't have this problem again? How can you assure us that won't happen? For example, it's very easy when you buy a software system off the shelf to know when it needs upgrades, well, maybe we can do a little bit of this internally with Neil, what have you. How can you assure us this problem won't happen again? Well, let's wait until I make a decision on what we want to do, and then, and then let's have that discussion, okay, because I think that's an important discussion. If, if I'm not mistaken, this, the, the four, B, with a B, four billion dollars per year we're spending is to maintain four or five or six different systems that don't work. At least 70% is towards maintenance of okay, the 4.2 so billion. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot of money. It's a lot of money. That we could be used for knee replacements or what have you. Okay, in my remaining 30 seconds, and Mr. Chairman, Mr. Bilirakis was very Gentile in saying he had a minute and a half. Anybody want that minute? I'd like that minute and a half. Is that possible? <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> um, Tell me, Mr. Secretary, what it's going to look like while our VA is uh, seeking their health care when we're moving away from big medical facilities to more uh, community-based systems. How is that going to uh, look to our veterans when they go and look for, for their health care? Well, look, health care healthcare is rapidly changing. I think what we're seeing is, is over time, uh, and you're seeing this outside the VA as well, a transition from inpatient-based care to outpatient-based care. VA is now about 90% outpatient-based care. I think over time, you're gonna see healthcare move to this. And uh, we are building a system, this is part of our IT assessment, that increasingly needs to reach the veteran where they are. Younger veterans, who as you mentioned, because of the demographics, are going to be our core target audience uh, as, as our older veterans get older. Uh, want care in a way that's different than past generations. And we increasingly need to, we can't expect for them to come into our buildings to get that care. We have to evolve our And systems. I'm sure, Mr. Secretary, that your new IT system will include those uh, devices. The gentleman's time's expired. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're back. Ms. Ms. Brownlee, you recognize me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think I might be the seventh or eighth member that has asked about IT systems uh, so far. So um, I think I'm getting a picture of, of, of what your intentions uh, are. And you talked about off-the-shelf systems or contracting out to support VISTA by July 1st and that you're going to make that decision. So I'm looking for not only the VISTA system, but for scheduling systems and and everything else that needs to be upgraded. And I you know, continue to say that I think our services to veterans uh, will only be as good as our IT services. And we're not gonna be able to um, be as efficient and timely until we do. So I guess my, my question is, and I don't wanna harp on it t too much longer, but when will you provide a, sort of a comprehensive IT plan for all the various systems we have talked about in these hearings of, um, you know, what, what your intention is uh, and your yeah. decisions are? 
are. Yeah. Um, I, I have said, and, and, and all the factors that you're talking about, Congresswoman, are um, things that I'm taking into account right now, not only the, um, the issues related to how can we best serve veterans, but as we're increasingly getting care in the community, we need to make sure that we are able to communicate in an inter interoperable way with all of our partners, not only Department of Defense, yep. but our academic centers. So there are a number of considerations. I, I've said that by July 1st, I will announce the decision and the direction that we're going. Once we do that, then we need to develop exactly what you're talking about, which is the comprehensive plan towards implementing that. And that's when we'll begin discussions with you and, and uh, uh, not only on the cost of these systems, but what that plan looks like. And as you know, when you uh, change directions, most of your planning is in change management. How do you get your organization ready for this? It's not usually the technology piece. Okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate our meeting that we had uh, yesterday in my office, and we talked a little bit about um, IVF services uh, to our veterans um, and getting that program um, off the ground. You had mentioned, uh, you know, in my office that there are 40 plus veterans that are somewhere in the process to receive um, IVF um, services. So uh, last night I was at a uh, Paralyzed Veterans of America mm -hmm. event um, mm -hmm. and uh, spoke with uh, their national president, Al Kovac, mm -hmm. and he explained to me, I was talking about our meeting um, mm -hmm. and IVF, and he said, well, He's in San Diego, and he said, I have been waiting, and I have not been able to find a fertility doctor that would be reimbursed by mm -hmm. the, the VA. And so he's stating that his time is running out. Um, and, um, I, you know, so I, what he was saying and what you were saying mm -hmm. to me didn't quite match up. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know where the problem is, if the problem right. is in... Um, you know, third party providers, um, if it's the reimbursement rate, you know, where it is. But, um, you know, I certainly would like to be able to um, get back what? to the national president of PVA and say, we have resolved this so that he has the opportunity to start a family. Uh, what we talked about yesterday was exactly this point that, that, that in our, uh, rush to get this program up, that we are still identifying providers to be able to do exactly that. Uh, I would suggest to you that you recontact the national commander, and um, my guess is, is that he'll tell you it's been resolved. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I, don't, I don't have much time uh, left, but a, a third question um, that I wanted to uh, talk about a little bit is, um, have, uh, in your budget, you talk about the number of veterans we need to serve, uh, we, that we have served in, um, you know, 2017 and, and who we will serve in 2018 and 2019. The numbers haven't shifted that much from 6.9 to 7 to 7.1. So I'm, I'm curious if the analysis uh, that you've done has taken into account other provisions in the, in the larger budget. And uh, it's Medicaid that I want to address uh, specifically. So, you know, there are a lot of veterans. One in 10 veterans use Medicaid services. Um, if we make those deep cuts uh, in Medicaid, Medicaid through this budget, have you, have you um, accounted for um, the additional demand, if you will, um, from veterans who will need those services? Mr. Secretary, I'm going to ask that you send that in writing, if you would, just for time purposes. We still have a lot Absolutely. of members that need to ask. I yield to, back. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for yielding. Um, Dr. Winstrup, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Pleasure to be with you again today. You. Uh, a lot of people have asked about EMR, and I, I can appreciate the decision process you have to go through because are we going to connect with DOD? Are we going to connect with the community? How can we do all this? Um, one question I do have for you, do you are, are you concerned at all that your decision for the best practice may be constrained by budget? Um, we are going to make the best decision for VA and for veterans, 
and come back and talk to you about whatever that decision is, if it has budget implications. I appreciate that, because I am interested in hearing, yep. and you know, what dollars are available, what you think is actually the best way to go. Yes. And, and we have to talk about that. Yes. I appreciate it. Um, you held up the device earlier, and, and you said, this is where medicine's going, and it just, you know, clicked in my head. Maybe our veterans all need some inexpensive little device that says, you talked about no-shows, that says, you have an appointment tomorrow. Yeah, um, and and on the issue of, of mental health, one of the things that I saw at home recently, and so I just bring this idea is somewhat fresh, and maybe it's on your radar. But uh, there's a uh, local mental health clinic on the bus line, and when you go there, if you have a physical problem, not just a mental problem, that treatment is available right there that day, as is their pharmacy. Everything is all under one shop. And they not only leave, but they get blister packs of these are the meds you take at 8 o'clock, at noon, uh, really increasing compliance and, and presumably, and I think so far we're seeing better outcomes. Uh, something to consider in, in the face of uh, compliance is that we go toward that type of system. But that being said, one concern I have with those other than honorably discharged, if they come in and they're in there for a mental health problem yeah. and their appendix is bursting, what are we doing? Yeah. Uh, for, first of all, VA, VA is a big believer in integrated behavioral health and physical health care. We do a million visits a year where essentially they're delivered together because it takes away the stigma of behavioral health. So it's absolutely important. Medication compliance. VA does better than the private sector. One of the reasons is we allow our pharmacists to practice at the highest level of their license, and they're actually doing a terrific job. Sure. VA pharmacists are really very, we're very proud of them. My grandfather was a VA pharmacist. Um, but I do think that, that there is um, a lot more that we can do with this, and so we'd like to work with any other ideas that you have. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. With that, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. For yielding, Mr. Ticano, you recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Mr. Secretary. Um, you know, I'm concerned about the proposal to terminate individual unemployable, unemployability benefits at age 62 for veterans eligible for Social Security. Now, most of the savings in this budget come from this proposal, uh, which is uh, $3.2 billion in 2018 and $17.9 billion over five years. Now, if a veteran was provided this benefit because of an inability to maintain gainful employment, particularly at an early age, he or she wouldn't have been able to pay into Social Security or put savings into a 401k or other retirement savings account. If you end the IU payments at age 62 for veterans like this, don't you risk plunging them into poverty when you shut off the IU payments? How are we going to deal with this? Um, we're we're uh, very... Um sensitive to this issue. Uh, we, have a, we have a system where um, we will add to our mandatory program for veterans benefits over $6 billion next year alone. This is uh, our growth in mandatory funding is uh, at a considerable growth rate. Now our veterans deserve that and we want to honor that and we are honoring that by seeing the, the level of growth. But uh, we also have a responsibility to make sure that our current mandatory programs are being utilized with the appropriate way. In this setting, uh, which, uh, which on the employability, uh, this benefit never stops. We have over 7,000 veterans above age 80 Mr. that we Secretary, are paying. The, 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 the proposal yeah. says you're going to cap it at age 62. Right. This makes no sense right. to me. Right. Currently, we don't cap it. So we have 7,000 veterans that we pay unemployability uh, payments for above age 80. And so the, the 62 is when veterans start getting access to their other benefits like Social Security. And so, so this is a way, we think, of appropriately utilizing the mandatory funds, of which we're increasing by six billion, but we're also looking at where do we believe that we can make the program more responsible. Okay, I, I wanna read you an excerpt from some of the responses from uh, the VSOs over mandatory spending that you propose mm -hmm. for uh, the choice, uh, the choice uh, program. Uh, the, the VFW is very concerned 
uh, that the administration's request to make the Veterans Choice Program a permanent mandatory program could lead to the gradual erosion of the VA health care system. Uh, PVA, we believe Congress must reject continued funding of this program through a mandatory account and place it in line with all other community care through the discretionary uh, care account. Uh, why does the budget propose to extend the current choice program with mandatory spending? Um, that's, that's my, what, was this due to the discretionary caps or does the VA eventually intend to fund all VA medical care and services with mandatory uh, appropriations? What's the rationale here? Well, uh, we're, seeking, we're seeking to run the community care programs as a single program. We spend, and the budget allows for $13.4 billion to be spent in community care. Of that, $2.9 billion is in mandatory, but the rest is in discretionary. Do, do, you, do you understand the VFW's concern about gradual erosion? Uh, because one of the concerns I have is uh, the, the, uh, the growth of uh, care in the community, private sector care, uh, uh, the, their ability to hire advocates, um, and uh, their increasing, uh, the increasing value of that, of that uh, expenditure is going to, I think, put a lot of downward pressure on other parts of, uh, the v, uh, of VA health care. Uh, and that, I think that's what they're getting at through. Are well, you concerned about this at all? Well, uh, of course we're concerned about it. Um, I'm always concerned about unintended consequences, and that is not our intent to, to see that happen. We are, we are grateful that this budget includes money for the continuation of the choice fund. And remember, the, the last budget did not include that. And so this is... Uh, a indication that there will be continued support to allow our veterans to get the care they need. Uh, it was split between mandatory and discretionary, but that is something that we believe that we can manage those unintended consequences to make sure that their concerns don't happen. Well, we'll, we'll obviously pursue this in the months uh, to come, but mm -hmm. um, I, I appreciate your, your Thank responses. Thank you. Thank you, General, for yielding. Mr. Rutherford, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary. Good, good to see you again. Um, I, I first want to bring up the issue of uh, the Inspector General's office, and, and, and I believe in this budget there's actually an increase uh, up to 120 FTE, which is a 47 um, FTE increase. Um, yeah, yeah. Is is there is there any um, is there any intention to renegotiate the AFGE uh, contracts, uh, the, you know, the master, the master collective bargaining agreements? Okay, so let's just clarify about the IG because cause yeah. now we've heard two separate things. Are, oh, okay, so, so the IG's budget in 2016 was $137 uh, million. <clears throat> it went up in, in 2016, I'm sorry, 100, 137. It went up to 159.6 and in 17 it was held flat at 159.6. So the, so the increase was between and that, 16 oh, look, and 17. Okay. And that okay. was yeah. well over a 15% increase yeah. between 16 and 17. So there, you're, you're correct regarding their full-time equivalents this year, their estimates, 773, and it goes up in 18 by 47 to 820. Right. So, so they're, they're still ramping up. Yeah, they're ramping okay. up. They weren't able to hire over this past all year them, all okay. that they needed. Good. Um, and then, and then your, your second question was on the... What, renegotiation. Yeah, on the renegotiation. Uh, our contracts are currently in force, and we have... Uh, Mark, do you know the status of that? I think that we've begun the pre-conversations but it's not going to be an early negotiation. It's just going to be honoring the commitment for the contract that it is, but starting to begin those negotiations looking into the future. Okay, because those masters were last negotiated in 2011, correct? Yeah, I think that they're, yeah. Okay, okay. Let, let, let me go back to the, uh, Mr. Ticano's uh, discussions about choice, because y you and I had a conversation that, um, I thought it was very enlightening for, for me because I, I, it was an angle that I really hadn't thought about. And, and you talked about how increasing choice uh, actually can help change the culture within the VA and, and in fact, provide better care and service for the veterans who, who, are, who are coming there. 
Uh, can, can, and how that's, I, I believe that was number one yes. on your list of five, yes. five uh, principles that you really want to address. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that on how, how choice can have that very, very positive impact on, right. on the organization? Yeah, uh, look, I think it is the most important strategy that we will pursue. I don't know an industry that produces a product that isn't that an industry that or a company that is successful that isn't customer obsessed. Mm -hmm. So you have to be completely focused on what your customers need. And the reason why companies are customer obsessed is because their customers have choice. And, and if they don't if they don't produce something that their customers want, then they lose their customers. And that is the issue in VA, that all too often people have adopted an attitude that veterans don't have choice and that the mm -hmm. veteran isn't treated as a customer. Now, fortunately, the vast majority of our employees are mission driven and do understand that. But we have too many employees that frankly have taken veterans for granted. And we're gonna stop that and we're gonna say, look, when you give veterans choice, if you work in the VA, it's an honor to work in the VA. We have a real critical mission and you better understand that these are customers and treat them as if they're customers. And that's mm -hmm. the difference in culture that we're trying to impose. And, and I applaud you for that. You know, we, we, we also, it seems like every time we, we meet, we talk about mental health and, and uh, and I know what an advocate you are. It's been discussed here uh, <laughs> ad nauseum almost. Uh, but but this is a this is a topic that uh, you know is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I, I was a, as a former sheriff, having run a jail, uh, I, I saw firsthand uh, those folks. In fact, I ran the largest residential mental health care facility in Duval County. That was the Duval County Jail. Sadly, um, mm -hmm. and and to go back to. Uh, the other than honorable, uh, the, the expansion uh, of mental health care services and, and others like hepatitis C and some other things. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit ab uh, about um, how, I, I don't want to leave people with the impression that folks with dishonorable discharges are actually going to right. uh, receive this service. Can you talk a little bit about right. that? Yes, uh, there, there's certainly a difference with those that um, are dishonorably discharged, so they committed a crime or, 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 or had an ethical or moral act that led to their discharge right. versus those that were other than honorably discharged. And when you take a look at the other than honorably discharged, it often does trace back to some type of behavioral or emotional problem, uh, often caused by their involvement in a conflict. And mm -hmm. so, so, you know, while that's a determination made by the Department of Defense, not by VA, we feel responsibility at right. VA to be able to care for those service members. And, and ergo, their discharge. Exactly. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Creel, you recognized. Mr. Chair Poe and, and Ranking Member Waltz, thank you very much for the hearing. And uh, Secretary Shulkin, welcome. Thank you. Uh, you know, this, uh, this committee has been doing some really good work lately on, on health care and, and VA's appeals process. Yet, as I was listening to my colleagues and your responses, uh, you know, I, I had to take a pause when we were talking about the appeals process and how that would affect current folks on the pipeline. You mentioned 2026. And uh, then we talked about, your, your words, health care system going through a lot of rapid changes research budget cut, uh, best intentions. I don't want to be here in five years and say, wow, this went wrong with the system, these unintended consequences. We didn't foresee them in 2017. So my question to you, sir, can we put a system in place that gets input feedback from our veterans, uh, something that's real time, so that as we're implementing all of these systems, we actually can figure whether they're actually working or not. I don't want to be here in 2026 and say the backlog is still five years away from being addressed. Yeah. We are, uh, much like um, I just answered before, to be a good, effective organization, we have to be uh, customer responsive, and that means that you better be getting that feedback. So we are 
this is one of the changes in VA. We are working much more to understand the veteran experience and putting in real-time tools to solicit the feedback. I will tell you right now, though, that on the appeals process, uh, while uh, we very, very much hope the Senate passes a bill just like what you did yesterday, that will only fix it moving forward. I do not have an answer that would prevent us from being here five years from now still talking about the backlog. This is something we've got to put our heads together on and figure out a different approach to this problem. Or that the backlog is actually increasing five years from now. Well, I don't think the backlog will increase because of, that is, if the Senate passes the bill, that will allow us a process to make sure that it doesn't increase. But we still have in backlog uh, way too many claims and appeals. And so that's something that we still have to come up with a better answer on. Thank you very much. Uh, second question, sir, uh, Secretary, is uh, uh, so yesterday we had breakfast? Yes. Yes. Uh, we were talking about the veteran cemeteries, and I mentioned yes. Orange County. Um, has your staff yes. found out any information yes. on the Orange County Veteran Cemetery? Yes. Um, the, the staff has said, uh, after we've gone back with the comments, that their commitment is to have a cemetery within 75 miles and of, of where a veteran resides. And that given where Orange County is, is that the two current national cemeteries in Riverside and the other location, I don't know if you, yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. We also have a cemetery in Miramar. So Riverside um, actually encompasses all of the geographic uh, um, location of Orange County, as does Miramar in terms of the majority of um, Orange County. Um, we're also establishing a, um, a, an expansion program or an ex expansion project at uh, Los Angeles National Cemetery, which will construct a columbaria-only urban initiative cemetery there that will enhance access to the residents of Orange County. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, so I, there's not a plan. Right I, I think now. we're miscommunicating yeah. somewhere, yeah. and I'd like to follow up yes. with you on the let's, discussions here because our Orange County veterans do, um, you know, have earned that right in their families to visit their deceased ones in yeah. Orange County. The difference is, as you know. 75 miles in a rural area is 75 miles. 10 miles in LA or Orange County is a whole lot different. Yeah. Um, but I know there's been discussion. I'll follow up with you to okay. make sure. I know the governor was just out to visit a site in Orange County, the city of Irvine, on this specific issue okay. less than two weeks ago. I believe there may be some funding in the state budget for matching or what have you. So there has been active okay. movement in that direction. And I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. It well, that's why like I appreciate you we're raising We're miscommunicating it. right now, right. but we'll get to the bottom of Good. it. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Mr. Banks, you recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary uh, Shulkin, mm -hmm. for being here with us again today. I want to return to a discussion that you already had with my colleague, uh, Representative Kaufman, a little bit ago. Uh, the VA's budget submission includes a $1.2 billion increase for funding for medical facilities, including activation of new medical facilities and non-recurring maintenance expenses. Could you elaborate for a moment on how you arrived at that dollar figure? Yeah. Um, the NRM funds, which, which are where we see the 1.2 percent, I mean, 1.2 billion increase, are essentially $10 million projects and less. Uh, we have a $17 billion capital deficit in NRM funds. When we've gone out and we've said, what would it take to get all of our facilities up to speed into where they need to be at $17 billion? The $1.2 billion increase, we think, is a uh, uh, maybe not enough, but a good, reasonable start. And we appreciate that increase from where we were last year because it's going to make us allow us the opportunity to prioritize those projects and really move forward with them. They are not major construction projects. These are replacing the roofs and the HVAC systems and the medical equipment that's necessary. We, we talked about this before as well with the VA identifying 430 vacant buildings, 735 underutilized buildings, maintenance cost of $25 million a year for those facilities. What, what can you maybe help the committee 
identify legislative remedies to help you navigate the politics yeah. of dealing with that situation? What, what we're doing right now, we're following through on the Commission on Care Recommendations, which really uh, asked us to uh, develop a plan on what to do, on what to do with our facilities. Uh, as you know, the Appropriations Bill also requires that VA develop a national realignment strategy. So we're coming up with essentially what we think from a business point of view we should be doing to best use our resources to help veterans. Then we're going to need to come to you and we're going to need to work with you to find the best legislative way to address uh, supporting these underutilized and vacant buildings. Thank you. I appreciate your attention to that and uh, thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Walsh, you recognized. Well, thank you. And again, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'm appreciative of it. And I, this holistic budget approach, and I, I'd be clear, from my perspective anyway, a very bad budget. Um, looking at the VA, which is my responsibility, feels a little bit like me looking at a house that <laughs> is on fire and saying, well, the drapes are nice in it, um, even though the rest of the house is on fire. So coming back, though, to what you can control and what we have responsibility in here, I just wanted to make note of this because the OIG is very near and dear to my heart. The OIG, the way I understand it, was flat funded for fiscal year 2017 at 159.6 million, stopping their three-year expansion plan, which was reflective of the growing and sustained demand for oversight in the VA. Their requested funding for fiscal year 2019 as part of that expansion plan was 197 million, which would have allowed their staffing levels to get up to the number they were trying to reach for that plan. Is that the way you understand it? Uh my understanding is the request for Mr. Missile made the request for additional FTEs in uh, fiscal year 16 was granted them, and his budget in 18 allows him to be able to achieve those 120 FTE increase. Um, 19, uh, we, we, we don't have the budget for yet. Okay. So you're, at this point, not overly concerned that we're going to have the IG. We've depended in here on yes. the IG extensively. Yes, okay. yes. I think you're going to see the the expansion that he asked for, and he Very can good. do that. I'm going to come back to choice again because we're all going to come back to choice again. You said, Mr. Secretary, that more veterans are opting for choice. Are you tracking whether or not the veterans who use choice would prefer the VA or not? Because I, I don't have to remind you, the VA is a choice too. So you said you want to give the customer choice. Are you cutting off that choice for another choice. Are you tracking it to know what they're saying? Um, first of all, when we give choice, it really is choice. The veteran can always choose to stay in the VA. And in fact, uh, we want a system that they will choose to be in the VA. But they can stay at a later date. What I'm saying is if we plussed up the VA side and it was equal access to what they're getting on the outside, would they choose the VA over the outside if access times were equal? Well, in fact, many, many veterans, given the option of choice, do choose to stay in the VA system. And we are trying to beef up the VA system so that where we see long wait times or services that aren't offered, we're trying to build that up. But the best uh, data that I know of on this is still from the VFW and the VFW survey that asked this question. Yeah. And by far, most veterans pr prefer and choose the VA. I'm going to segue on to that. Keep in mind, and, and again, this we need to talk candidly amongst ourselves. When we look at voc rehab being cut 4.5, we see medical research being cut, but we see care in the community without a plan being there beefed up. Um, it is a concern, and I quote from the VFW, very concerned that the administration's request to make choice a permanent mandatory program could lead to a gradual erosion of the VA health care system itself. What is more concerning is that the administration has chosen to make permanent a flawed program before the fix. That's coming from VFW. Uh, I believe I've got uh, paralyzed veterans. The recommendation begs a question. Does this recommendation suggest choice programs currently designed should continue in perpetuity? So those are the questions that are going to be out there. There's, they're asking that. So none of us here, me included, has ever said we shouldn't use care in the community. We've known it's been there. I think the concern, and I would, or I would characterize it to you as this, it's concern because they're not sure what's coming. Uh, is that fair to you? I mean, are you hearing yeah, that? Yeah, uh, look, uh, VFW and all of our VSO partners are, are, are so incredibly important, and we, we work with them always to understand their concerns and use their input. But look, here's the way I look at the budget. Uh, the 
amount of money overall, $13.4 billion for community care, stays essentially um, where it is. This is not a massive transfer from funds from the VA into the community. This just, this, this funds and continues what we've been doing in the Choice Program. The increase in the budget that, that the President has proposed is actually increasing discretionary funds in the VA. This allows us to continue to build and strengthen the VA system. Let's continue to talk to them about that. I'm going to end with, with an IT question. Um, I quote from the President, I will create a private White House hotline for veterans. It's answered 24 hours a day, and no valid complaint will fall through the cracks. If it's not answered, I would answer it personally. What's the phone number? Yeah, I don't have the phone number yet, but let me give you an update on it. I just it, don't it have It comes the out of your number. budget, am I right? What? So I, in my time-honored Minnesota passive aggressiveness, I asked that question. But in the real side of things is, this is a drain on your IT budget. Is it going to happen or not? It is going to happen because the president has committed that that's going to happen. Uh, the full system, the full White House hotline uh, will be up towards the end of August, but we're going to be doing what I call a soft launch June 1st, which is that calls will be sent from the White House uh, and answered as the White House hotline, but it's going to take us till the end of August to get a contract in place to be able to do this with professional call contract centers. But June 1st, you'll see a soft launch of this. And we'll get a cost estimate by then. We, you will get a cost. We are very conscious that we want to do this in a cost efficient right. way. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Uh, Mrs. gonzalez Colon, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for, for uh, the yesterday meeting and all your mm -hmm. efforts. Uh, I saw the, the question by Mr. Banks about uh, the construction uh, funds, and I see that the budget does not include a significant allocation for construction funds, and I see how and, and why you, you just explained that. And I understand the reasons for that. However, uh, there's only one VA hospital in our island, as you may know, and uh, one state home. And uh, although we got some satellite clinics, we need to expand uh, for better facilities for our better, veterans. Uh, what may be your thoughts on that issue uh, for our island? What can, we, what can be done in that matter? In terms of infrastructure improvements? Yes. Um, the mark does our does our budget yet indicate how much money will be allocated to the vision and to the facility? Are we talking about specifically San Juan. infrastructure? Yeah. Uh, I'll have to go back and look at the list, but we have NRM projects across all visions. So I imagine there will be some, but we can get you a specific amount. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you. If you let us follow up with you on the specific projects, but, we'd be glad you. to do that. And um, one of the issues is the mental mental health. Uh, residential clinic. Uh, right now, we just got 30 beds uh, for mental health patients. As you may know, we got more than 93,000 uh, veterans in Puerto Rico. So it's 30 beds are not enough. Mostly when we uh, attend not only Puerto Ricans veterans, but people coming from the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, so it's more than more than uh, an issue for us. Um, we just saw, the, according to the job announcement uh, issued by the VA, the salary of the specialist of uh, more than 100,000 to 300,000 in the cases of, uh, you know, specialist neurologists, orthopedics, uh, uh, psychiatrists, and other, uh, and other people that are needed in the VA hospital. We got a shortage of medical specialists in the VA hospital in Puerto Rico. At that money, has been allocated in the budget to hire those positions in our hospital? Um, the, you're talking about money to hire the needed positions or increase salaries? Uh, for the, the money to hire those positions. Yeah, I, I mean, San, San Juan has a budget that um, will be negotiated with the vision. I mean, Mark, do you, do you know? Uh, we can, we, we'd be glad to sit down with you and review with you the San Juan budget, um, but I don't think we have that information here, do we? I don't have it here, but it's largely driven by the we amount We can of coordinate that uh, later yeah. on then. Yeah. Uh, because I need, I, I know that the shortage of those uh, medical 
um, specialist. It's, it's a situation that is going worse and worse, not only in San Juan, the sat satellite uh, clinics and other issues. And with that, I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlelady, for yielding. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here today. It's been great. I was just looking at how many members participated. There were multiple meetings across the campus today. And and it uh, shows you the interest in, in the VA. And, and I'll uh, now ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to, uh, to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material. Without objection, so ordered. And Mr. Walsh, do you have any closing comments? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you as always. Uh, you have done nothing other than gain the trust of this committee. You've done nothing except serve veterans. You've done nothing but uh, come to this committee since your time's here with, uh, with solution-based problem solving in an honorable way. So our pledge to you is to work Great. and do everything we can to make sure you have the resources and the authority to serve our veterans. So I thank you for that. Thank you. And I'll, I'll uh, associate my remarks with Mr. Waltz uh, and, and also uh, mention that we've, we've had a lot of, we just got the budget yesterday and obviously we, it's going to take us some time, both sides of the aisle, to go through this. So we'll uh, probably both sides will be submitting some questions to you all that we didn't have time to get to today and we'd appreciate as quick a turnaround as we could get. And, and just to, to make sure that, uh, that our uh, viewing audience and our VSOs and so forth and our veterans out there as we approach this Memorial Day, understand there is a commitment on the administration's part to, to grow. The VA and healthcare providers are growing. Uh, this budget grows the number of healthcare providers, not shrinks them. So I think it, from what I've looked right here, from what I've seen at, at a preliminary blush, it certainly does that and supports the VA's primary mission, which is to take care of our veterans. I once again want to thank all of y'all. You were very open, Mr. Secretary, with having the whole committee over at uh, your shop yesterday, and, and I would like to take this opportunity to wish both the committee and everyone and, and the veterans out there a happy Memorial Day. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Thank you. I lost my gavel here. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Good job. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you got to come back. Okay.